How is everybody? We're excited to have everybody here, not just our coaches, but all the participants. Um, and one thing, I'm Chris Collinsworth from Sunday Night Football. One thing you may not know about me is I also own um, uh, Pro Football Focus, which is a data analytics company. And I now have all of your resumes. <laughs> don't think of this as an interview in any way, but I am excited to meet you as much as I hope that you're excited to meet these coaches and listen in uh, to what they have to say. Because it's not often that any of us get to sit down for a half an hour uh, with the head coach, the defensive coordinator, and the assistant defensive line coach from the world champion football team from the prior season. And we get that opportunity right now. We have a half an hour until we get to the breakout session. So I am not gonna waste any more time at all. We're gonna get right to this and start talking a little ball. But I would be remiss because Bruce, I think that I speak for everybody when I just wanna first of all say congratulations on what you accomplished. But secondly, I've gotta know what were you thinking when Tom Brady threw the Lombardi trophy from one boat to the other. That's all I really want to know out of this whole night. Uh, Chris, you know, Tom Brady is going to be complete. <laughs> what, who is going to catch it on the other side? And especially not, don't catch it in the face. Just catch it. And uh, But, it, you know, you heard of his daughter holler, no, daddy, no. Uh, but it was, uh, yeah, it was kind of special. Uh, let me go on to Todd here for just one second. And uh, Todd, we've got a lot of people who want to get into football. Um, these people have dreams, just like you and I did, and and Bruce and Lori and everybody else, that they wanted to get involved with football, in particular with the National Football League. If you could put two or three bullet points together as to what's the key? How do you do that? What, what's the key to getting in? I think it's it's all about connecting with the person you know. And there's there's a ton of football coaches at every level right now, so it's hard to say everyone's going to get into the National Football League. Getting into the National Football League is like becoming a head coach. There's only 32 of them. You know, there's only 32 jobs as far as position coaches are concerned as well. So, and some assistants are included in that. But it, it's all about networking and who you know and getting your face in front of someone and and then it becomes down to getting to know the person what their philosophy is and if there's an opportunity yeah todd i know you've said many times the number one way to get in the national football league is to get a job with pro football focus and i've always respected that opinion that you've had <laughs> for a long time uh, uh, Lori, I, I i've got to get to you next because i i loved watching you coach this year i got a chance to come out to practice and seeing you get physical with some of your uh, your players out there uh, as as your path unfolded and in many ways you you've blazed the trail for a lot of people um is there something that you now know about coaching something that you now know about interacting with these players that maybe you didn't know when you started the process where you were at some of the, the same place that some of the people on this call are today? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think at this level, uh, it was a lesson for me to not overcoach because when you're coaching at some of the lower levels or at, you know, where I started like in high school, you know, you're constantly redirecting, you're constantly looking for, you know, a way to correct and redirect and, and really have that player just consistently hear that same message. And, you know, when you continue to move up the levels, you know, obviously these guys are professionals, they've been doing it for a very long time. Um, it's not that they're not open to coaching. And I think we're very lucky in the building right now because the group of guys that we have is very open to coaching. Um, but you just have to, you know, kind of read the room more or less and not feel as though you always have to make um, a comment or you don't always have to redirect uh, somebody at this level. And um, I think just taking the cue from your position coach, taking it from the coordinator, um, and really sort of seeing where you can kind of fit in to the process and help make it better without trying to overtake it or overdo it in any way. 
Uh, Todd, and you're sort of on the flip side of that. You've been both uh, underneath a coordinator and, and underneath a head coach. And as a head coach, you were underneath a general manager. How much of that is true, that you need sort of a singular message that's passed down throughout the organization or at least on the defensive side of the ball? I think it starts with the head coach. You know, you need a singular message from the head coach as to who we're going to be, what we're trying to be, and how we're going to play. And I think Coach Aarons does a great job as having a great pulse of the team and understanding what they need each day and giving us direction as far as the how to go about it. And I think once you have it from the head coach, who also coaches the coaches, it's up to the coaches to devote, diverse that message to the players and for all of us to be on the same page. So once we get that across, I think you have continuity, but it's constant and it changes every day and the pulse changes every day. And, and Bruce does a great job of taking care of that pulse. And we as assistant coaches got to make sure we get it to at least our side of the ball. And Byron has to make sure he gets us to his side of the ball, as well as Keith and the rest of the coaches as well. Uh, Bruce, I've, I've known you for a long time. I've followed your path. I've interviewed you a, a thousand different times as we go down the road. As you went from a position coach to a coordinator, to a head coach, how much less football was involved the closer to the top that you got and how much more other stuff did you have to get involved with and how much did you actually miss the hardcore coaching that came with those positional coaches? Yeah, I mean, especially when you have your room, you know, you have your room and you have your guys and you have a connection to those guys. And then you step into the coordinator role and it's, you know, 25 to 30 guys. And, and it's a different uh, – And I was still the offensive coordinator even when I was the head coach when I, when I got going. So I, I had to maintain some level of my room. I, I still want to be involved with the quarterbacks. Um, now having Byron running the offense, for me, it, it's, it's so easy. I can still have relationships with everybody, but um, just to step back and let people do their job. Uh, Lori, I know that uh, obviously one of the big stories of Super Bowl were the, the Kansas City Chiefs had injuries at the tackle position, which probably impacted your ability to study who those other guys were and to come up with, with some, some different answers. But anyone who watched the Super Bowl will agree that uh, the play of the defensive line, the defense in particular, was just phenomenal, right? I mean, hold them to nine points after everything that had been going on. But was there a moment in time that week where you guys go, ah, I, I feel good about something. I, I feel good about uh, what we're going to be able to do here. I think you touched on it a little bit earlier. Um, I think if you go back to the first Kansas City game, um, you know, they came out and uh, were playing a little bit of lights out. But if you look at the way that the second half really played out, where the adjustments were made, I think that was a precursor for anyone who knew us going into the Super Bowl. And I don't know that there was an aha moment that week, but what I can tell you is that in the two weeks leading up to the game, and maybe because it was here, right? Or maybe it's because we knew that we could, that they were beatable uh, and we should have beat them the first time, but there was such a calm in the building. And I don't ever remember anyone that entire two week period saying or having any doubt that we weren't going to win. Uh, Todd, let me ask you about evolution of defenses. Um, I, I've always enjoyed watching your guys play. There's a, an aggressive mindset. I go back to the Green Bay game this year. You guys were down 10 nothing. You started blitzing everybody but your mother-in-law coming in after <laughs> Aaron Rodgers. and almost sent him to Denver, but that's a different story. And, you know, and, and I, I kind of look at your your – linebacker room, right? Uh, Devin White, Levante David, athletic guys. Uh, even in Arizona, you did some of that where you really wanted to have somebody where you could play man coverage, where they could get across the field. And so much of the game now is also about those deep over routes and the Tyree kills of the world that can, you know, challenge from the man side to the zone side and vice versa and all the different things. But as you look at evolutions of defense, what, how, how willing do you have to be to change, you know, to go, you know what? I've done this my whole life, but this is a good idea. I, I think we need to incorporate this. 
I think you have to be smart enough to be dumb. I, I really think <laughs> you have to be smart enough to know when to step back and you watch the film and you see what the offense, it changes every two or three years. And, you know, Coach Arians does a good job of putting us in situations in practice where you practice a lot of things. But, you know, depending on the game, we can blitz a lot or we can blitz a little. It all depends on who we're playing and what they're trying to do. I think the evolution of the game has changed due to the fact that the fullbacks are almost extinct right now. So that takes away a lot of the power game. You can still run a power game from the gun, but there are so many small, quick receivers now. And the, the younger the guys are coming out of college now, everything is RPO, left to right or right to left. And you need faster linebackers behind the ball to keep up. And then three down linebackers, you can't have a first, second down guy and a third down guy because they won't let you change personnel. So I think it's changed. It's more of a lateral game and a speed game from that standpoint, from a defensive standpoint. Uh, Bruce, as as a head coach, and we've got a, a lot of people who are listening that are interested in being a part of this great game. Um, how much of the game now is the personal relationships with the players? And how important is that to the game because yeah, they're all pros, but they all have different family stories. They all have different ways that they were treated throughout the course of their lifetime. And you probably have whatever it would be, 80 different relationships with 80 different people. Can you explain how you have to lead in today's age? You know, I, I think the word discipline was lost for a long, long time. And uh, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not a father that put you in timeout. All right, we, we had a serious conversation. <laughs> you didn't go to timeout. We're going to fix this here and now. All right, it, and the first thing I tell our guys when they come in, you know, especially the new ones, all right, you're going to get your ass chewed out. If it's not perfect, we're going to correct it. But don't take it personal. It's not criticism. It's coaching. All right, you're a hell of a guy, but your football stinks right now. I want to tell you about it. All right, but you're a hell of a guy. So if 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 it's a day where you're really on somebody's ass pretty good, I'm gonna probably find them in the locker room, make sure they're good, you know, and just let them know that you know the last thing that Coach Bryant taught me when I left to go to be the head coach at Temple a long time ago, I said, coach him hard and hug him later. Well, it's been a great privilege of mine to uh, be a part of this discussion with the world champions, and you guys are world champions because you have great players but you have great coaches that have spent a lifetime getting to this point. And thank you for including me in this discussion and uh, can't wait for opening day against the Dallas Cowboys. You got it, Chris. Appreciate thank it, you. Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much. At this time, we'll be moving into assigned breakout rooms for the small group question and answers. Um, I'm Alex Hanna. For anyone I don't really know in here, I am um, currently our tight ends coach and uh, director of football operations over at Oberlin College, which is in um, just around Cleveland, Ohio, we'll say. So I really appreciate you guys taking the time. Um, my question for you, Coach Lowe, um, starting it off. So having a coaching um, aspiration myself, uh, mm -hmm. but not having played uh, any football, just a little bit of flag um, in my time, how much of your coaching and football knowledge comes from you having played four years um, of football with the Central PA Vipers? We touched on it a little bit in the main session. Having connections is so important because, um, and I'll make this brief because I want to get to everybody, but one of the things I would always do when I would go to clinics is I had made myself uh, business cards because the teams that I worked with you know, it, we just didn't have them. I made a point to try and connect with people there and then follow up with them because what happens then is that they may not know you from your area, but if your name comes up, it clicks. And every coach knows somebody somewhere. So you have no idea who might know the coaching staff that you're working with currently. And then when an opportunity comes up, They'll be like, oh yeah, I know such and such at that college. Let me give them a call about her. And then that's how this kind of continues rolling outside of the forum. 
the forum is always good for that, but really try and make the connections, do what you can to get better outside of what you're doing currently, and then just keep talking, keep trying to connect. Uh, my name is Monique Boone. I am the uh, offense, varsity offensive line coach at Hawthorne High School here in Los Angeles, California. And my quick question is, uh, do you keep the same mental preparation from week one of the season all the way through the Super Bowl, or, or does it vary throughout the season and circumstances? My mental approach as far as preparation is the same. I may tweak practices of what we do and how we teach and give a jolt to practice and start practice differently on the defensive side of the ball so it doesn't get stale. We don't do the same things every day. We'll have a turnover drill once a week and it'll be different type of turnovers. There'll be four or five stations, whether it's the strip station or a strip sack station or the rip and roll or a fumble recovery fall station. We'll have the sack station where we're coming from the blind side and we're trying to knock the ball out or we'll have pursuit drill or we have an interception drill or we'll have, you know, we have uh, pass protection drills, depending on what happens that week and what we need more of, you alter and you tweak the practices till that standpoint and you try to never make it stale because if it gets stale and it get monotonous, you're gonna lose the mentality of the player. So you always gotta have ideas and shock treatment coming. It doesn't have to be every day, but every other week or so, or every two weeks, you better change your the way you teach and the way your approach is so you can get the best out of your guys. Uh-oh, Coach Aarons, they put me in the hot seat. Start it off. There you, go. there you go. I'm Ashton Washington, currently at Texas Tech, Director of Recruiting Operations and Creative Content. I think my question might be a little tricky. We'll see though, you ready? You bet. Can you describe, you know, how you think a coach's approach or mentality has to change or should change, if all, when making a transition from college to the professional level? I don't think so at all. I, I, I was, you know, I was a college coach, and then all of a sudden I got the job at the Kansas City Chiefs, and, you know, one of my former players was on the team, and uh he said, Coach, you can't coach these guys like you did at Temple. I said, that's the only way I know how. And uh, so, yeah, we get after it pretty good. And uh, the, you earn that respect. And uh, it's not given to you. You have to earn it. And uh, so I think if that's the coach you are that got you to the job, why would you change? Hi, thank you for taking time out today and talking to us. Really appreciate this. Um, so I'm Lachelle Stanley. I'm currently the coordinator of on-campus recruiting at the University of Arizona. And my question is on the lines of respect that you have or have gained um, during your time coaching, what was that like gaining respect for like with players and coaches as you started out, um, not just in the NFL, but just in general coaching in a male-dominated sport? Self-language is a huge part of this, right? You have to believe in yourself sometimes more than anybody else does. What I want you guys to think about is think about eliminating that word male dominated or that phrase male dominated and start to use male prevalent. I've even heard male saturated and I'm okay with that one too. We never wanna position ourselves in a less than type of framework, even when we talk about ourselves, right? Or we talk about the career that we wanna get into. And it's minimal and it's semantics and I get it, but there's not one time that I've ever felt dominated. There's not one time that any of my colleagues have come across like they're trying to dominate me. So I don't wanna be less than, and I don't wanna create in their minds like an adversarial type thing because it's, it's that term is just really like strong against where we're trying to go. So Try and try and try and get that one out of the uh, the system, and it it'll definitely um, put you in a better frame of mind as you move forward. So my name is Monita Lucille, and I'm a production coordinator with the Dallas Cowboys. Looking forward to seeing you on the first game. Yeah. When, when you got your first no, what did you feel, and then what did you do? My first no. Yes, sir. My first no was in college, uh, going into my senior year, I was going to be an all American. I was going to be a draft pick and I dislocated six out of seven bones in my wrists. So I went, 
And when the draft came around, I couldn't even do a push up or a bench press at the combine. And Coach Arians, who was my head coach at the time, told me I need to start working on my degree and looking at other options because I'm probably not going to play football anymore. And that was like a no to me. And I, I, I took that very personal at the time and I was driven to make it. And I got a free agent tryout with the Redskins. And then eight years later, I retired. And that was probably the first thing that drove me, you know, as a player, as a coach. I think my first NFL job was with the New York Jets as a defensive back coach in 2000 with Al Groh. And we had a successful season, nine and seven. We missed the playoffs by a game, but nobody got fired. And I was watching the wild card game that next weekend and he took a job at the University of Virginia, but I had to find out on television and it was my first NFL job. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So now I'm out of a job and my first job. And you know, that was kind of a no to me, but they always tell you in the NFL, your best job is your second job because you wouldn't get a second job if you weren't a good coach. So I was fortunate enough to get a second job with the Cleveland Browns and it kind of went from there. So that, that was kind of those two things kind of stand out to me to this day. Good evening, coach. My name is Joy Topaichek. I just recently transitioned out of the Navy. I spent 11 years as an intelligence officer. Uh, I'm currently a volunteer to the Navy football recruiting coordinator. When considering your philosophy, no risk it, no biscuit, and recognizing that each member of your staff likely has varying levels of risk tolerance, how do you establish a common understanding of appropriate risk with your staff? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, for me, uh, where that came from is as important as the question. As a young player, I think it was high school, our, our coach put the poem If by Roger Kipling in our, in our playbook. And basically, you can't be afraid to throw your hat in the ring and take a chance. And uh, so I've kind of lived that way ever since. Um, way I live life, way I coach. Um, I think there's, there's a, I mean, one of the greatest risks was Byron Cullen that play at the end of the half in Green Bay, you know, thinking 80 go um, was the play and they came out and we throw a touchdown with six seconds left. That's a high risk call and a high risk play with great rewards, you know? And uh, so I think there's measured, measured risk reward. And, uh, and for me, uh, even to the, how we practice, you know, for, for practicing really, really hard, there may be some times like, hey, these guys, I'll talk to the trainers, I'll talk to the, the strength coaches, and it's like, how tired are these guys? They said, coach, we're right on the verge of maybe getting an injury. Slack off, take it back. You know, so don't take the risk of keep continue practicing hard uh, when it's not smart. And so, you know, you 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 got to play smart, not scared, and that's part of no risk and no risk.